morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Good morning, everyone, and good evening to all of you who are not based in Asia. My name is Krishna Oak, and I'm the AAS um, uh, Senior Advisor to the Board of Directors. Um, it's with immense pleasure that I am introducing this special panel on um, a very specific topic uh, concerning one of our favorite monsters in, uh, in the history of cinema. I would like to, to give everyone a bit of background about the, the, the idea of this special panel. So as everybody knew, we had to uh, move from a, a hybrid format to a virtual one. And, um, and this idea of, of creating a special panel on Godzilla really came from a conversation that I had with Alisa. And I'm, I am really indebted to her. Her creative intelligence and her passion really made this happen. And also for a lot of the creative features and, and cultural events that we we actually had for the past five days. So um, this is going to be a fascinating, fun and uh, very informative panel. And I would like to thank uh, the three speakers who are here with us today. Um, I'd like to first introduce uh, uh, Shunya Yoshimi, who is professor at the University of Tokyo's Interfaculty Initiative in Information Studies. He has also served in multiple positions at the University of Tokyo, including Dean of Graduate School of Interdisciplinary Information Studies, Vice President of the University of Tokyo, Chairman of the University of uh, a Tokyo Newspaper, Chairman of University of Tokyo Press, etc. He studies contemporary Japanese cultural history, everyday life, and cultural politics from the perspective of dramaturgy. His major works include Dramaturgy of the Urban, The Politics of Exposition, Cultural Sociology in the Media Age, uh, Expo and Post-War Japan, Pro-America, Anti-America, Post-Post-War Society, and many more. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Yoshimi, especially for accepting uh, graciously this invitation in, in very short time notice. Thank my <laughs> my next speaker is Alisa Friedman, who is a professor of Japanese literature, cultural studies, and gender at the University of Oregon, and she's also the editor in chief of the U.S. Japan Women's Journal. She is the former AAS Northeast Asian Council chair as well. Uh, she's published many books, including Tokyo in Transit, Japanese Culture on the Rails and Road, and annotated translation of um, Yasunari Kawabata's The Scarlet Gang of Asakusa and co-edited volumes on modern girls on the go, gender, mobility and labor in Japan. Our third speaker is uh, William Tutsui, who is currently the Edwin O. Uh, Rishawa Distinguished Visiting Professor at Harvard University and the former president of Hendricks College. Uh, Bill is currently the AAS editorial board chair. And uh, he's a specialist in the business, economic and cultural history of 20th century Japan. He's the author and editor of eight books, including Godzilla on my mind, 50 years of the King of Monsters, in Godzilla's footstep, Japanese pop culture icons on the global stage and Japanese popular culture and globalization. Thank you ever so much, Bill, also for accepting to join this, uh, this panel. You really made it possible. And again, your, your passion and enthusiasm really made it so much fun to to work with all of you so in the build-up of of all that I have to say that I did I did a bit of homework and I expanded the family collection of of DVDs here that you can see this is a very modest start uh, my my husband and children are absolutely delighted uh, there are 32 uh, I still have a lot to go but this is to tell you that there's so much to say. Sadly, we only have an hour, not an hour and a half, because of teaching duties on the other side of, of the world. But within this hour, we will be the three panelists will be speaking and discussing five questions. And I would uh, recommend that the audience keep their questions to the end and actually type them on the Zoom. There's a Zoom group chat here that you can use, and I will be uh, picking up the questions and, and relaying them to Alisa, who will be uh, doing the, the, the MC the entire time. So without further ado, I would like to pass on the baton to Alisa. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Krista, and thank you to AAS and Asia for hosting us and hosting Godzilla. Thank you, everyone, for joining us from around the world, and congratulations to AAS and Asia for a really successful conference. Your hard work truly paid off, and it's been really impressive. As Krista mentioned, our panel will have three main parts. First, we're going to have brief introductions by the panelists. Then we're going to open it up to four or five questions. Um, and then after that, we'll take audience questions. So this panel's meant as discussion and ex open exchange of ideas. So we would really love to hear from everybody out there about what you think about Godzilla. Um, the first presenter will be uh, Professor Sitsui. Would you like to go first, Bill? I would be happy to. Great, it's all yours, take it away. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Good morning, good evening. I appreciate you all joining us today. I really want to thank Krishna and all the folks at IFOR uh, for making this panel possible. It is a huge honor for me to be here today uh, with Professors Friedman and Yoshimi, who are truly superstars in framing our understanding of Japanese society uh, and culture. And it's a joy, of course, to be talking about one of my favorite topics, uh, the Godzilla movies and their significance in Japan after World War II and in global pop culture today, with an audience from around Asia and around the world. Now, my task at the start here is just to give a very brief background on the Godzilla movies, because while everyone, I think, is aware of Godzilla as a media icon, not everyone may be familiar with the history of the Godzilla franchise. So Godzilla is now just over 65 years old, which means the big guy is a card-carrying member of AARP. He gets the senior discount at Denny's, and most of his scales have turned gray. Indeed, Godzilla has always been gray, not green as he is usually portrayed in the media. Over those six-plus decades, Godzilla has starred in 32 live-action movies, 29 made in Japan by the major studio Toho, and three in Hollywood, as well as three feature length anime. At several points in time, the Godzilla series has looked to be on the verge of extinction, but it has always come back. And today the franchise is stronger than ever. The first film, and I would say the greatest of them, was Gojira, released in 1954. And it was a dark, ominous, politically charged film that introduced the idea of a dinosaur rendered monstrous by American H-bomb testing that proceeds to attack Tokyo. The movie was a hit in Japan and was subsequently heavily edited with most of the anti-nuclear message removed for distribution in the United States in 1956 as Godzilla, King of the Monsters. The Godzilla series and Godzilla himself have changed considerably over the decades in the themes addressed, the audiences catered to, and the character and appearance of the monster. In the 1960s, the Godzilla films became more lighthearted, less overtly political, and more targeted at youth audiences. From the 1980s into the new millennium, the series turned more, ser turned more serious and somber again, and utilized more sophisticated special effects. The most recent films, including the 1998 Godzilla, made by TriStar in Hollywood, a new series in the legendary pictures MonsterVerse franchise started in 2014, and the most recent Toho offering, Shin Godzilla in 2016, have breathed new life into the monster and engaged with timely issues like the 311 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown. The Godzilla movies and it, their success launched an entirely new film genre, kaiju movies, and spawned a virtual menagerie of new cinematic monsters, both those in the Toho series that fought Godzilla, so Mothra, King Ghidorah, Rodan, and so forth, and those created by other Japanese studios seeking to tap into the popularity of creature features, most notably Gamera, the giant flying turtle. Foreign filmmakers also sought to get into the act from Gorgo in Britain to Pulgasari in North Korea to more recent Hollywood blockbusters like Cloverfield and Pacific Rim. Parodies and tributes have also appeared in great numbers, including Monster X Strikes Back, Attack the G8 Summit, Big Man Japan, and Colossal. Although many people don't take Godzilla movies with an actor in a rubber suit walking through toy cities very seriously, 
Godzilla should be recognized as a pioneer, as the first creation of post-war Japanese mass culture to gain international exposure and acclaim. Godzilla has gone on to become a true global icon, especially in the United States, where Godzilla is a staple in advertising, in pop culture, and even in our language. The Zilla suffix makes any word, Truckzilla, Mozilla, Bridezilla, seem big and mean and angry. Godzilla, in short, has become deeply woven into contemporary life and into our collective unconscious around the world today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. That was excellent. Is that a picture of Godzilla versus King Kong in the background? Can you hear me? Uh, the next pro uh, pro professor to introduce is Professor Yoshimi Shunya. Um, and you're able to share the screen, the screen Professor uh, Yoshimi? Yes, yes. And good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And so let me share the screen. Uh, here. Slide show. Okay, so uh, let me start uh, briefly about uh, the little bit background of this monster movie because uh, Tsutsui san uh, discussed uh, perfectly, uh, exp he explained uh, the importance of Godzilla movie. Uh, and Japanese and global context, contemporary global context. So uh, let me explain a little bit about the background, uh, especially as a monster movie also. And uh, in, in, in Japan, uh, uh, the post-war Japan context. So uh, in the 1950s, uh, it was not Godzilla movie, but also some of the other monster movie, not only in Japan, but also in the US. For example, in the same time, uh, Beast from uh, 20,000 Phantoms or some of the other monster movie also produced in US. But there are some difference because big difference is uh, the American, roughly speaking, American monster movie was not, were not uh, stronger than city. They did not destroy the city, New York, uh, Los Angeles. But in case of the Japanese monster, they always destroyed the city itself. For example, uh, the Godzilla, uh, let me let you talk about some of the other monsters because uh, maybe some of you know, or many of you know the Tokyo Tower, which was built in 1958. And every year, almost every year, the Tokyo Tower was imaginarily destroyed. Many of these gold, uh, monsters, most Lava, most King Ghidorah, Gamera, and, and so on. So the question is, why the Japanese monster was so strong uh, and destroyed the cities again and again? The, the, the reason is that especially Godzilla, but in many of the other monsters, uh, uh, so this is, this is uh, some of the images. Uh, they destroyed uh, images, uh, they just destroyed the, the Tokyo Tower from 1960, 1970, and even after 2000. So the reason why uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the specificity or peculiarity of the Japanese monster in, from 1950s was they are strongly embedded in the in-war and post-war uh, Japanese historical context and experience, especially in war time, and uh, and experience with the, 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 the how to say bombing and uh, American bombing in 1945. So this is the image of the Godzilla. The above two fear to two images is um, images from Godzilla, and uh, uh, below two uh, images the film uh, to to photo is a real uh, photo in 1945. So there is a strong connection between the memory of the war and uh, how to say the, the emergence of the Godzilla in 1945, 1954. So, so because in 1950s, there's strong antagonism between the, on the one hand, anti-nuclear, because Godzilla was emerged from the, how to say, the atomic bomb testing in Marshall Island. So, uh, in 19, uh, bikini artillery testing uh, and the Rocky Dorogan incident in 1954. So 
there is a strong antagonism between the, on the one hand, uh, the atoms for peace uh, policy by Eisenhower administration, and on the other hand, anti-nuclear movement in Japan. There is a strong, and in Godzilla emerged, especially in this, in this context in 1950s. So in 1950s, on the other hand, the Atoms for Peace Expo and Atoms for Peace policy, how to say, go around the world, especially in Japan, even in Hiroshima, uh, the, how to say, the Atoms for Peace Expo was, was, was held in, in the 1950s. And the, the Japanese government and the American government tried to change the horror and anger against uh, uh, the atomic bombing to new understanding of atomic energy. So they really changed uh, the, 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 how say, changed the, the atmosphere uh, uh, towards uh, uh, atomic energy. So there are two typical discourses in 1950s. On the one hand, a uh, discourse of salvation. Uh, uh, the, in, 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 there are many discourses like this in newspaper. Uh, they, it, it is said that uh, as Japan has suffered by destructive energy of atom, Japan may wish improvement of human life by same atomic energy. And there are also another kind of the discourses in 1960s, 1950s and 60s. Uh, it is said that as Japan has a scarce resource after we lost all colonies, atomic energy is the only way to make us possible to recover our economy. But, uh, and based on this process, the, after the 1960s, Japan experienced a, a rapid economic growth and alongside with economic growth, Gojira, popularity of the Gojira decreased from in Japan in from 1960s, 1970s. Gojira became more cute and cute. His face, his face changed from the lizard-like face to a uh, frog-like face. And finally, uh, he can sit along uh, with uh, uh, Kitty-chan. So cutification of the Gojira go on in 1950s, 1960s. So, uh, so this kind of the process also uh, has uh, exist uh, in case of the Tokyo Tower itself. And, but finally, uh, the, how to say, the, uh, I, I will show this film. It's called uh, in 2016, uh, in case of the Sin Gojira, because Sin Gojira uh, has say, the directed by uh, Anno-san, uh, Hideaki, Anno Hideaki, he, he explicitly showed the connection between the Gojira, image of the Gojira with uh, September 11 as well as uh, March 11 in, in, in Fukushima nuclear plant incident. So this kind of the connection is continuously exist in this Gojira image. Thank you. How I finish. Thank you. That's a fascinating amount of material. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, for those of you who just entered the room, welcome. We're starting off our panel by each of the presenters giving a very short presentation to lead up to the questions, which will be the, the uh, way we spend most of our time. And I am just going to briefly talk for about three minutes to um, sort of put together some of the wonderful things that professors uh, Tsutsui and Yoshimi have already discussed and talk about how we could bring this material into the classroom. So my part is pedagogical and I'll offer some teaching suggestions about how to put some of this wonderful material to use with students. My part is based on my undergraduate survey classes on introducing Japanese popular culture and Japanese popular culture in the world. I also hope my comments will um, interest uh, scholars because teaching is a wonderful way to synthesize and explain our research. So Godzilla is a node that brings many things together as, as Bill and Yoshimi Sensei have already explained. Some uh, related interdisciplinary strands of discussion include, for example, monsters as metaphors. And we'll talk more about that, what Godzilla represents. Go Godzilla in and uh, about history and how Godzilla represents a particular pattern in the globalization of Japanese popular culture, namely the removal and recalibration of cultural contexts. What I mean by this, I'm drawing from Professor Tsutsui's work in this, in that Godzilla is a franchise that takes on new meanings when it's localized through erasing 
or inventing uh, political context, adding layers of interpretation through dubbing and becoming available in different formats. In my classes, we closely watch and we analyze and comment on Godzilla films. We watch the mystery science theater style where the students do running commentaries as we watch the films, because as, as Bill has argued in many of his wonderful books, including Godzilla on my mind, that um, Godzilla should also be enjoyed for its campiness. So in my classes, we strive to, to, think, to think about how people have consumed Godzilla. We also pay attention to language in Godzilla, not just the bad dubbing, but as Bill explained, the suffix Zilla turns anything into big and powerful. We pay attention to media, aesthetics, politics, society, gender, and more. And Godzilla as a popular culture icon with obvious social, political, and um, cultural meanings helps construct images of Japan at home and abroad. So Godzilla has also been a cultural ambassador. Um, many of you know it's very difficult if you're a foreigner to become a resident of Japan, but Godzilla was able to do so in 2015. This is a monster that, as Yoshimi Sensei has said uh, well, tries to destroy Japanese cities. So to do this, I lecture at my students, but we also do engagement exercises, and I believe we'd like to share two of these exercises with you. My goal with these exercises is to help students understand how Godzilla emerged from historical moments and the reasons for Godzilla's enduring popularity. I also want the students to understand more generally how they engage with popular culture and make it part of their lives. So what we do, I ask my students, and, and if time, I could quickly share two slides with you. I ask my students to create monsters that Godzilla can fight, that represent anxieties. Um, using Godzilla as an inspiration. In doing so, I want the students to consider aesthetics, uh, the importance of how Godzilla looks, moves, and sounds, in addition to what Godzilla is. I also want them to think about narratives, how Godzilla is embedded in a story, and we'll talk more about that. Um, I also ask the students to share their personal memories with Godzilla, but then we break into groups and we talk about Godzilla's marketing potential. And as a class, we design Godzilla products that we would like to produce. Um, for example, we talk about what Godzilla should be on and what Godzilla should never be on. And my favorite class product so far is the Godzilla shower head that spews hot water from its mouth with LED lighting. I think all the residence halls when they reopen should have this. So I'll try to share my screen. I can't promise that this is going to work because um, my, my um, Zoom can be glitchy. Can you let me know if, if the sheen, a screen is being shared here? Can you all see my students? Yeah, monsters? perfect. So here are some of the monsters that my students have come up with. You could recognize the coronavirus up there. And they also think about how we envision monsters within stories. Some of their other products that they've come up with, they think that all students should have a Godzilla alarm clock. What Godzilla should never be on are government documents and medical equipment. So thank you. I'm going to unshare my screen for you now. Can someone help me if I have trouble doing this? All right. Thank you. Are we unshared? So now I'd like to move on um, out of my screen here. And uh, we'd like to spend the next 30 minutes or so discussing questions among ourselves. And those of you in your audience, um, please do share your questions in the chat. This is a discussion and we would really love to hear what you think about Godzilla, especially since you just watched Godzilla movies and thought about them. We would really love to hear from you. So I'd like to pose the first question. Um, and these are questions generated by the panel beforehand. So why use a monster like Godzilla to represent anxiety? How does Godzilla give a face to fear? And Bill, would you like to tackle this question first? Sure, I'd also like one of those Godzilla shower heads, please, <laughs> if you could sign me up for that. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I was so proud of the <laughs> Students, are, Students are wonderful. <laughs> well, you know, to get to the question about Godzilla and anxiety, uh, one of the characteristics of modern societies, it seems to me, and to many cultural commentators, is a sense of ambient fear, a pervasive anxiety that saturates daily life. Sometimes this fear is widely discussed and publicly agonized over it, like at the moment we're at right now. But much of the time, I think people try to avoid speaking about their fears and try to push fear into the backgrounds of their minds. In Japan in the 1950s, when Godzilla was born, this anxiety derived from the unresolved legacies of 
World War II, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, as uh, Professor Yoshimi spoke about, and from the threat of nuclear annihilation in the Cold War. In the world today, and especially in America, there are more ambient fears than I can list, uh, starting with COVID-19, of course, but including income and healthcare insecurity and concerns over issues like democratic governance and racial equity. Such anxieties often manifest themselves as a widespread fascination with monsters, a fixation that I think is born of the twin desire to name and to give a face and form to fears that are often abstract or invisible, like radiation or viruses, and to domesticate control and imaginatively overcome and in the process disempower those things that threaten us. So in short, monsters like Godzilla help us make our fears more concrete and thus more manageable. Seeing a giant lizard on a movie screen or reading about Dracula in a novel or hearing about dragons in a medieval tale allow us to have the cathartic experience of imagining some of our worst fears come true, but also the liberating and reassuring experience of imagining those fears being controlled and ultimately defeated. So what I think is really remarkable about Godzilla and all this, uh, 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 a character that's been such a vibrant cultural icon for almost 70 years, is the range of social fears we've been able to project into him over the decades, from nuclear anxiety back in the 1950s, to concerns over commercialization and corruption in the 1960s, to environmental worries in the 70s, uh, to more recent obsessions uh, with natural disasters, dysfunctional political cultures, and climate change. While Godzilla himself has only one setting, big, angry, and destructive, he has amazingly avoided being typecast, and he's performed a wide range of roles, villain and hero, metaphor and symbol, manifestation of radiation and death and memory and a dozen other things over an incredibly long career. Thank you. That's fascinating. Yoshimi Sensei, would you like to add anything to the discussion? Yes. Uh, yes. So, Sumi san already uh, explained uh, very, very perfectly. So, let me add uh, a little bit about the uh, Japanese context because I think Godzilla is uh, uh, an imaginable something, an imaginable thing imagined by uh, separate people or the people within the anxiety. So uh, in case of Japan, the, from the late 1960s to 1980s, uh, Japanese society is very stable and not so, how to say, the, the, the affluent and economic growth and uh, everything is basically okay. So from late 1960s to early 1980s, in Japan, Gojira was not so popular. So, uh, so the popularity of the Godzilla was evident before early 1960s and after late 1980s. So there is some kind of the, how to say, the, the, the correlation, uh, correlation between the emergence of the anxiety or crisis or difficulty and the popularity of Godzilla. So uh, in case of 1960s, it was very evident, as Tsutsui sensei already explained, there's a nuclear incident in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki and uh, uh, Japanese, how to say, the, the uh, war bombing, and especially the connection with the uh, experience of the uh, American uh, Air Force bombing and the Gojira was very evident because the uh, original Gojira in 1964 was, uh, 90, 90, 90, sorry, 1954 uh, was, uh, Roughly speaking, anti-American movie, anti-American sentiment was very, very clear in, in 90, Godzilla in 1954. The, the very clear reason is the, there are no US Army in Godzilla film in 1954. Godzilla was so gigantic and so strong and the Japanese self-defense force was so weak. So the very, very basic question is why Japanese self-defense force asked U.S. Army to help us. The answer is, Gojira was a U.S. Air Force itself, in some sense. 
Gojira, the destruction by Gojira was a destruction by US Army, US Air Force bombing. So, uh, so, so that, that is the reason why the Gojira was, uh, because Japanese people in early 1950s cannot express directly uh, about uh, anti-American sentiment. Anti-American uh, how say that uh, American, such kind of the popular sentiment. So Gojira is represented some kind of the, how to say the feeling, unconscious feeling of early uh, 1950s Japanese people, especially who, especially the people who still have a very strong, how to say memory of the suffering by uh, bombing. Thank you. That brings together so many themes uh, that monster movies are not for children. They represent very adult fears and um, they give face by visualizing many things. And we just got this excellent question in the chat from someone in the audience who mentioned the coronavirus and how COVID-19 is a new fear in our global uh, in our global catalog of fears right now. You can think about the characteristics of monsters like Amabie. Monsters tend to arise from the sea like Godzilla, even Amabie, tend to, or fall from the sky. I was just re-watching King Kong versus Godzilla the other night from 1962. It was amazing, Godzilla came out of a glacier. But um, you can think about how monsters are not totally vanquished either. There's always room for them to come back and what that says. Um, so we'll keep these questions going, but I'd just like to pose a second question that um, this leads off of what Yoshimi Sensei was just saying about your fascinating discussion about the Japanese historical context, about how does Godzilla differ between Japan and the United States? Do audiences in both countries generally see Godzilla in the same way? And how does Godzilla, uh, maybe we can continue Yoshimi Sensei's excellent discussion about how Godzilla is a commentary on US-Japan relations during certain times. Mm -hmm. um, Yoshimi Sensei, would you like to add to that? Or, or um, Bill, would, I'll leave this up to which one uh, of you would like to, to jump yeah, in. Uh, yeah, yeah, short comment. Thank you very much. A fascinating question. And also the two, two is very fascinating question. So uh, let me read a bit try to answer a uh, little bit uh, to the first question about the uh, relationship between COVID-19 and the Gojira. Because roughly speaking, there are two differences between Gojira and the COVID-19. Uh, one is uh, Gojira come from outside. Gojira come from outside and destroy the, some kind of stability of the society. So, uh, so this, uh, how say, but in case of the COVID-19, of course, uh, there's a uh, many, many, how say, uh, discussion. But the important thing is uh, such kind of infection, uh, how to say, expanded from inside. So uh, in case of the Japanese film uh, after 1980s, because uh, the most happy film in 1950s, uh, in my sense, uh, in Japan, uh, changed to what taken over by the animation film after 1980s, including Akira and the uh, Neo Genesis Evangelion and uh, some of the other uh, the very, very how say, fascinating the animation film, basically took over the basic sentiment of the Godzilla or monster film in 1950s, so uh, after 1980s. So in those films, uh, because uh, uh, let's think about the uh, uh, to say Akira or Evangelion. So the disaster and some kind of the how say, horrible thing can come from inside. So, so there's a more close connection between the such kind of animation film and, uh, and COVID-19. Uh, and so, uh, so in, in, in exactly in that sense, Shin Gojira uh, directed by Anno Hiroaki san is very important. So, uh, also, uh, in relation with uh, Japanese specificity or peculiarity in a, uh, or the connection of the American film, because Bill can explain uh, the, uh, the global context in American context much more, how to say, uh, the perfectly than uh, me. But in Japan, as I said, the emergence of the Gojira film uh, in 1950 was strongly embedded in the historical context of post-war Japan and the post-war Japan and the US relationship. So uh, this connection, because 1950s and 1960s are quite different. The Japan and the US relationship was quite different. 
because in 1950s, the, within the Japanese popular sentiment, there is strong anti-American sentiment and consciousness still. And there is a many, many of the, how to say, anti-American military based movement and the military, American military force movement. And there are many, many movement in 1950s. After 1960s, after the Japanese US treaty and after 1960 incident, uh, Japan started to go economic growth and such kind of the uh, strong anti-American sentiment decreased rapidly. So, uh, so the Godzilla film is, was, is strongly uh, uh, connected in, in Japan, that kind of the historical change from 1950s to 1960s. So, so maybe Bill can explain the difference between US and Japan much better than me. You know, there's so many great ideas there. Let me just uh, make maybe three points. Uh, first is US impressions of Godzilla are still largely associated more with a humorous, goofy, cheesy Godzilla, the Godzilla of the 1960s and 1970s. One reason for that is the 1954 original film Gojira was not available in the United States until after the year 2000. So we really could not see uh, Godzilla as it was meant to be in, in, Jap in Japan. That most politically charged film was not available uh, to American audiences. Uh, and also, of course, Americans did not have the experience of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the fire bombings. Uh, so for we do not have that same um, uh, uh, sort of historical baggage that the Japanese have brought with them uh, to the series and don't see that historical relevance. A second thing uh, about that uh, is the Genesis story uh, of Godzilla is very clear in the Japanese version, right? Godzilla is created by American H-bomb testing in the South Pacific. American audiences have never liked that narrative and never wanted to buy that narrative. Right? So that was erased uh, in 1956 when it was brought to the US as Godzilla King of the Monsters. But most importantly, uh, in the more recent film, so in the TriStar picture from 1998, Godzilla is created not by American H-bombs, but by French nuclear testing in Polynesia. Okay? Uh, and then in the legendary series, uh, it turns out Godzilla was not created by H-bombs, but instead Godzilla was a naturally occurring monster that came out of the ground at, and then the Americans tried to kill him with H-bomb testing and hide that from the world. And so in this light, nuclear testing almost becomes humanitarian uh, on the American uh, perspective. So this is another point I think that's relevant. And the third thing, I'll just mention this briefly. Americans, when they think about giant monsters, really want to see monsters that are driven uh, by biology and genetics. They want to see uh, a natural motivation for the monsters. Where in, whereas in Japan, monsters have characters. Monsters have personalities. Maybe even monsters have souls. Uh, Godzilla means something and is fighting for something rather than just being driven by this urge to protect its young or go back to its home or something like that. That's excellent. I've always often wondered into American television commercials, for example, the Snickers commercial from 2014, about why God's, American Godzilla is always hungry. <laughs> It's a reason to tear apart a city. Or that's a really good point. I was thinking about the territoriality of Godzilla as returning to Japan, or even how um, Godzilla has been incorporated into the landscape of Tokyo, like having a giant Godzilla statue at Tokyo uh, Midtown Shopping Plaza in 2015 with a plaque that said one seventh actual size. So I guess it was a smaller <laughs> Godzilla or Godzilla in different parts of the city of Tokyo. But Bill, that's a really excellent point. You've raised so many great points too. I'm um, thinking of the original Godzilla film about the oxygen destroyer as being the machine to take down Godzilla and the debates about science in the film. Yoshimi Sensei, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. And can I add uh, uh, some additional comment because the uh, mentioned a very, very important uh, point uh, about the difference between the US Godzilla and, and connected with the biology and Japanese Godzilla. So uh, in case of Japan, so let me add, as a, how to say, the, besides my explanation about the, the, with the relationship with the atomic bomb, uh, there are another kind of the interpretation of the Godzilla in relation with the Japanese tra traditional, 
how to say the the the, the especially the Shinto thought uh, because in Japan in Japan Gojira uh, cannot emerge from the biology but it emerged from the traditional how to say the 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 the, 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 the some kind of the uh, Shinto shrine uh, how to say the the religion because in some case in, in Japanese tradition thought the many of the disaster was caused the people traditionally the people believe many of the disasters the earthquake and the hurt and the disease and all these kinds of things thing was caused by Ondio. Ondio is uh, Ondio is a very strong the power of bad spirit. And most of the ondio was a spirit, but spirit of the heroic person, like uh, Masakado Taira and uh, Fujiwara, uh, uh, the Sugawara Michizan, and some of the heroic uh, the, the person was killed by the, the, the big power, the, by state and by emperor. And after the, the death, they became the very strong and super strong power. And they came back to the to, to the city and to the to our society, and they destroyed they destroy everything. So, and uh, traditionally Japanese people had to say the worship that kind of the worship, but spirit, super power spirit. So they built the shrine. So most of the Japanese shrine was constructed based on such kind of the belief to. To, to pacify the, to pacify that kind of the superpower, how to say, super, super, superpowers. So the, how to say, the background of the, 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 the theoretical or, uh, no, no, uh, the, uh, the background consciousness, the behind the, such kind of monster was quite different between US and Japan in that sense. Thank you. I, I'd like to move on to another train of thought. And we'd like to do maybe two or three more questions before we open up questions to the audience. And those of you who just came, our panel will be an hour and we'll end at 9 a.m. But we'll, we'll be happy to keep taking questions. And thank you to Philippe and others who are posting really good questions about superheroes and other issues that we definitely should talk about. But to add another uh, train of thought, I'd just like to ask Professor Sitsi, uh, Bill, what's, what are your personal experiences with Godzilla? Some so what are some of your favorite Godzilla moments? Yeah, so, you know, uh, I can remember vividly watching my first Godzilla movie. Uh, I was seven or eight years old. I was in my parents' bedroom lying on the blue shag carpeting. This is about 1970. Uh, big Zenith TV set, wood grain case. Saturday afternoon, creature double feature, channel 39 from Houston, Texas. There's Godzilla, and I fall in love immediately. I want to be huge. I want to be powerful. I want to destroy Tokyo. Okay. Uh, so, beyond that sort of juvenile physical response, uh, you know, I was a Japanese American kid growing up in a small town in central Texas. Uh, and uh, for me, Godzilla was really important to forming a Japanese American identity. Uh, at school, not many people had lots of things positive to say about Japanese folks. Uh, Pearl Harbor was usually the first thing that came out of people's uh, mouths. But when I saw Godzilla, I knew this was it. My friends would think this was cool and I could be cool uh, uh, by being associated uh, with that. You know, by the time I became a high schooler and then went away to college, Godzilla wasn't so cool anymore. Godzilla didn't get you a lot of dates. Uh, so it went underground for me. Uh, but I brought Godzilla back when I was assi an assistant professor and started teaching uh, Japanese history survey classes. Like you, Elisa, I found that uh, students responded very well to this. And you could really sucker punch them. Nobody goes into watching a Godzilla movie thinking they're going to learn something. Uh, and yet there is so much about Japanese history and the Japanese experiences we've discussed today that can come out of these films uh, that they became very powerful pedagogical tools. Uh, favorite movies, just briefly, first movie, 1954. If you haven't seen it, uh, you are not cultured. Uh, so go out and watch uh, the original movie. I would say my other great favorite is Godzilla versus the Smog Monster. Uh, Godzilla versus uh, Hedera in 1971, psychedelic 
crazy, makes no sense. Godzilla flies on his tail, uh, but a wonderful period piece. And again, as uh, Professor Yoshimi has been mentioning, very much rooted in the history of that time. Excellent. And thank you so much for the Godzilla versus Hedera recommendation. It's also my favorite film. It brings so much together and the psychedelia, the all the um, the child, the children, the gender aspects, the, the uh, pollution aspects, everything is in that film. Yoshimi Sensei, do you have a favorite yes. film that you would like to share? Uh, yes, and uh, but because of the Red Me uh, has a Red Me experience, a uh, Red Me by my, my personal experience uh, with Godzilla and Monster Movie, because I was born in 1957, and uh, in the early 1960s, uh, the Hase Monster Movie was a really, really, how to say, it's a booming industry among the young kids. And when I was, uh, I think, third year in the elementary school, so maybe I think eight or nine years old, I was trying to make most of film with my schoolmates, <laughs> but we don't know how to construct, how to make uh, the, how to say the, uh, the, the such kind of the, uh, the, how to say the, 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 the future. So uh, we believe, we thought we can make Gojira with plastic and, uh, and the paper and the plastics and paint and so we bought and we, we, we construct such kind of a big monster uh, because I was eight, uh, nine years old and uh, we construct the uh, actual the, the big monster is a plastic and, uh, and the paper, paper box and uh, something like that. And uh, uh, I was asked to get into that kind of the big box and I was trying to move and, uh, and exactly in that moment, it was collapsed. So we couldn't make uh, the monster film, but among the young kids in early 1950s, 1960s, I'm sorry, the, the, such kind of, the, how to say, among the, especially boys, uh, was, uh, the, was a very, how uh, to say, the booming industry. So uh, I have a, one kind of the theory about this kind of the generational gap, um, uh, a gener generational cycle of the, the popularity of the Gojira because the uh, important Gojira was uh, has made in Japan made uh, in, in, in 90, late 1950s and the late 1980s or uh, mid 1980s and 2010. So in case of the 2010s uh, Shin Gojira, the has said the, the grand grandfather or grandmother grandfather uh, who watched Gojira in mid 1950s or most of the movie in 19, fascinated by 1950s. Now he or she has a grandson and they can go to the Godzilla film again with his grandson. So there's a, some kind of generational cycle of Godzilla, the popularity of the Godzilla. But anyway, uh, the, I have said, uh, I, in case of the film, the, I strongly uh, has emphasized that kind of the continuity from Gojira in 1954, as Tsutsi san says, 1954 is still amazing masterpiece. So 1954 is so important. And uh, I think Akira uh, Hatsue, directed by Otomo Katsuhiro in 1988, is something very, how to say, the close connection between the Gojira in 1954 and Akira 1988. One is monster film and the other is animation film, but there is some connection. And uh, of course, uh, the Shin Gojira in 2016. So these three films are connected with each other. And Oto Katsuhiro-san and uh, Anno Hideaki-san are very, very conscious about the, what Gojira in 1954 meant. Thank you so much. Um, we've getting some questions from the audience and that brings us to another point. What is going on with the Godzilla franchise right now? What's, what's in the works? Bill, are you on the inside of-, of I, I, I wish I knew more. So, you know, <laughs> Legendary Entertainment has been building Godzilla into their MonsterVerse uh, franchise. Uh, the 2014 movie uh, Godzilla, I think was a pretty darn good movie. Uh, I think that took the best from the Japanese series and the best from American uh, Hollywood blockbuster uh, filmmaking. Godzilla in that film, film had a real personality. Uh, and the film also dealt, I thought, in substantive ways with our anxieties about natural disasters. 
Fukushima, San Francisco earthquake, uh, uh, Katrina, uh, and so forth. Godzilla King of the Monsters, which came out last year, uh, was not so successful, I think. It dealt in a much more ham-fisted way with the issue of climate change uh, and eco-terrorism, uh, uh, and uh, I think was a disappointment uh, to many folks. Uh, forthcoming, of course, is the movie we've all been waiting for, Godzilla vs. Kong, the remake of that 1962 classic showdown uh, film, which, of course, at that time was billed as America vs. Uh, Japan uh, on the big screen. Uh, I'm worried about this new film coming out. It's been delayed uh, because of the pandemic, but also because some of the test audiences apparently didn't respond very favorably uh, to it. Uh, and, you know, I think it's a great opportunity uh, to recreate that one-on-one -on -one matchup between these two uh, uh, really iconic monsters. And yet it seems like they're going to be a lot of gimmicks uh, in the new movie. They're going to bring back a lot of other monsters, Mecha Godzilla and so forth. And for the first time, they're going to have the monsters fighting underground, which just doesn't seem that fun to me. Uh, I really wish Toho could run with the films again. Uh, Shin Godzilla uh, in 2016 was a wonderful film, I think. Uh, Ano Hideaki did a marvelous job with it, really rooted uh, in some of the issues facing Japanese uh, society today, really a stylish uh, and thoughtful uh, picture. There has been some rumor that once the contract with Legendary is over uh, in 2021, Toho will reboot uh, a Godzilla franchise, but I'm guessing they're just waiting to see if uh, Legendary wants to extend that contract uh, and more money can be made that way uh, before they commit to making more films. Excellent. I'm going to move things along a little bit because we only have 10 minutes left and we're getting some amazing audience questions. But very quickly, Yoshimi Sensei and, and um, this is also to you, Bill. Would you like to, if, you, if someone would like to learn more about Godzilla, do you have any recommended readings that you could suggest? Because mm. I'm sorry, I'm, I, most of the books I, 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 and the base I, 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 I use is in Japanese. So I'm not so sure that I can recommend some of the has a good English materials. So I'm sorry, yeah. Okay. I'm trying to hold couple, this work right here. But. <laughs> I have a couple articles I would recommend that not a lot of people have seen. They are from the collection I co-edited with Michiko Ito in Godzilla's Footsteps. Uh, the first is uh, called Wrestling with Godzilla. Uh, it's by Aaron Giroux, who teaches film at Yale University. And it's wonderful on the intertextuality of monster movies and professional wrestling in Japan during the 1950s. Uh, it really does a great job in talking about that exuberant physicality of Godzilla and also bringing manga uh, in, which I think is really neat. And the other is by uh, Yoshikuni Igarashi, who's a historian at Vanderbilt. Uh, his article is called Mothra's Gigantic Egg. Uh, and it's about the connection of the South Pacific uh, to the Godzilla films, and in particular, the uh, 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 shadows of the Japanese Empire, the Japanese Empire in the Nanyo on the Godzilla films and how that then intersects with rising consumerism in Japan uh, during the 1960s. Really fascinating stuff. Excellent. Please don't forget my favorite book uh, about Godzilla, Godzilla on my mind by, by Bill Sitsi. <laughs> it makes a lovely <laughs> holiday gift, by the way. <laughs> Um, let's move on to some audience questions. And please, Yoshimi Sensei, and, and, and uh, please keep kicking in your great ideas. But before we move totally on to the audience question, I'd just like to address a question from Krishna's eight year old daughter. This was a question taken before the panel. And the question is uh, Who is Godzilla's girlfriend? I, I looked into this a little bit. Godzilla. <laughs> monster allies, but um, so far as nobody has come forth as Godzilla's romantic partner. Um, well, my maybe... answer, I think, would be a simple one. Some things it is better not to know. <laughs> Godzilla <laughs> keeps a very private life. Um, but we've gotten some amazing audience questions, and many of the audience questions have dealt with the current pandemic and how the Godzilla franchise would visualize. Like, for example, I don't know if you've been following the news story from April 2020 that one of the magic cards, you know, the card game magic, featured space Godzilla, but the weapon was unfortunately Corona breath. <laughs> so that card needed to be removed wow. from the deck wow. uh, in many yeah. countries. 
But I'm wondering if, and again, in the audience members, please feel free to share your comments. Do you think the Godzilla franchise, we talked about reasons why and, and how not Godzilla could visualize a Corona monster, for example. Would something be in the works about this? Um, relatedly, we also got another question about um, the current fascination for superheroes, globally Marvel comics and other superheroes are being made into films, not just fighting alone, but fighting in groups. Perhaps we can deal with, we could tackle these two questions together. Yeah, I'll like just start on the coronavirus question. You know, I think it's almost inevitable that the Godzilla franchise will deal with the coronavirus at some point. Uh, I hope that it can do so uh, in a thoughtful and responsible way. I really think in Godzilla King of the Monsters, uh, the way they dealt with climate change uh, was pretty pathetic. Uh, uh, it really was, at the end of the movie, Godzilla magically makes the earth cooler, you know? Uh, that is just not uh, uh, what we've come to expect from a movie that began, I think, really as a uh, uh, sober reflection uh, on uh, uh, the nuclear threat uh, in the 19 uh, in the 1950s. You know, I think uh, an interesting theme would be uh, how a crisis like this can uh, bring a society together or drive it apart. Because I think we have seen a lot of difference around the world. Here in the United States, our society has fractured uh, because of coronavirus. It has shown some of the fundamental splits uh, in our body politic. Whereas in many countries in Asia, uh, it has shown that fundamental strength, the way that people uh, can rally together uh, to try and defeat something. Uh, and I think there would be a very interesting narrative there, were I a screenwriter, uh, to do a Godzilla treatment of coronavirus. Excellent. And we've gotten some very good questions about the original Godzilla film from 1954. One audience member brings up the excellent comment about the oxygen destroyer and the debate about science. And hopefully you've all seen the original Godzilla film from 1954, which is very different from the American version of Godzilla King of the Monsters um, from 1955. But um, the use of the oxygen destroyer in the film and the audience member asked really well if, um, and I apologize if I'm paraphrasing the question wrong, if the film itself could be read in part as being part of a discourse of humanitarian nationalism and looking at sort of the, um, a reassuring kind of view toward the nuclear testing at the time. And this also goes along with some things that Bill was saying about the context in America about Godzilla. I don't know if one of you would like to take that on. Yeah, Yoshimi Sensei. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 I, I, I'm not sure uh, I, can, I can answer well, but uh, also in the context of the early 1950s, uh, I think there's a, some, how to say, belief, uh, the popular belief uh, in, in Japanese society. One is, uh, uh, how to say the uh, science and science tech and technology uh, do good job for the humanitarian purposes. And the second is uh, there is very strong, uh, how to say, the, the, how to say, the anti nuclear movement as well as uh, how to say the peace movement. So the peace and science and uh, how to say, and still in 1950s, the people still believed uh, we can construct. Uh, another more peaceful and uh, how to say humanitarian society. Uh, so uh, the, the, there's some kind of the idea which was embedded in or, or which was uh, how to say it, uh, uh, implemented in the, uh, in the narrative in 1954. So, so the, the, there's some how to say the, 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 uh, uh, items and some of the items which appeared in 1954 film. Uh, but I, I think uh, the same kind of the dreamy item is also connected with the popular belief in from late 1940s, 1950s, including the technology. And um, uh, can I add uh, the one uh, comment to the uh, COVID-19? Um, okay, uh, let me explain. Uh, because in case of the COVID-19, for me, the most important thing for the COVID-19 is a connection with the globalization, uh, uh, of course. Because COVID-19, current uh, coronavirus pandemic, is a result 
of the how to neoliberal globalization after uh, after of the 1980s. So it is very very connect, closely connected with, for example, the September 11 and also the Lehman shock and uh, also the uh, the Brexit and uh, uh, Donald Trump presidency. All of these things happened in the process of the reactionary process of the, how to say, the, 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 the neoliberal globalization of the 1980s. So in that sense, the globalization and such kind of the pandemic, uh, infection pandemic is, uh, how to say, the historically repeated again and again because it is same as the 1980s and 19, 18, 19s, 18 and 19s influenza pandemic. And also it is same as the uh, uh, red 19th century, the 1870, after 1870, based on the, how the British Empire, uh, the, as a, how to say the, the Korea, 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 Korea in Japanese, Korea, Korea, other as a pandemic, Korea, mm -hmm. Uh, my pronunci pronunciation is very bad, I'm sorry, but came from the India, Bengal, mm -hmm. to, 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 to express, spread the globally uh, in the early 19th century, based on the, the uh, in British Empire. And in the 90s and 60th century, in, in North and South America, the, how to say, small pop, small, small pop? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm right. Uh, the expanded because of the great, big, great sailors. And of course, in 14th century, in 14th century, the Black Death, Black Death came from the Mongolian Empire, the, another kind of the 13th century globalization. So the, how to say the Corona pandemic uh, need to think, uh, uh, need to, to be thought, uh, how to say the longer historical process. And in that sense, the Gojira uh, can be transformed to completely another, how to say, image, uh, because uh, Gojira was so closely embedded in uh, how the historical imagination of the red 20th century. But if we try to think a corona pandemic more seriously, uh, we need to think about the relationship between the globalization and pandemic, uh, maybe uh, five or six or 700 or more than thousands of the years. So how to say the, the image of, the, of this pandemic should be much, much more, how to say, gigantic than <laughs> Gojira. This is my, my, my sense. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up and our apologies for those of you who are expecting more Godzilla, but you can watch our, the recording of our panel. Uh, which will be available through the AAS and Asia website. I just wanna very quickly mention a few other questions that we've gotten in the sidebars, questions for future consideration, including the aesthetics of Godzilla. And also if uh, we can watch Godzilla and Ultraman paired together as a commentary on uh, both destroying and saving aspects of Japanese cities and society. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Yoshimi and, and thank you, Bill Sitsui. Thank you for all your wonderful ideas. And thank you to Krishna, who I'm now going to turn the uh, virtual microphone back over to. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you ever so much. Um, it's really with great reluctance that this uh, fantastic panel is, is really coming to an end. And I can see from the, the group chat and um, and really the, the, the quality of the exchange that everybody was kept captivated and and happily captive at the same time. So we, we hopefully will carry on with our conversation when the next Godzilla movie will, will come out. And uh, well, uh, what is happening now is that we are going to be taking a break until 9.45. Uh, the next session on the main room will be a Konrad Adenauer Stiftung sponsored panel on automation and innovation, followed by a special late breaking news panel on new threats to academic freedom. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the parallel sessions will continue until quarter past 11. I uh, wish you a very good night and uh, a very good
good start of the day to all of you. Thank you ever so much for coming. And again, to our fantastic panelists and uh, Elisa for doing a brilliant work moderating. We, we will have you again, I, I promise. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye.